Before we get into power series, though, I wanted to talk a little bit about strategies for testing series, okay? And just kind of talk once again through where we have been and perhaps uh, foreshadow how we will be using these things in the future, okay? Kind of spoken to this a little bit. I spoke to it a little bit yesterday, but uh, when you're going through this material, especially, it's always good to refresh our memories in terms of what it is we are talking about exactly, okay? So uh, here is kind of a plan, uh, you know, an algorithm, if you will, for, for how you proceed through the series test stuff. Okay, so guidelines for testing a series for convergence or divergence, okay? And uh, this is how my brain works. I typically go straight for the nth term test, okay? And I simply ask the question, does the nth term approach zero? If not, series diverges immediately. You're already done. Does that make sense? If the terms approach zero, though, you move on, yeah? You move on to some other approach to, to try to sort things out. So that seems kind of like a, you know, sort of a low bar, uh, you know, simple thing to apply on the front end, for sure. Does that make sense? We've talked about this a lot, but I just want to make sure. Like the nth term test to me is the first thing you should always try as kind of a hierarchy of, of tests to apply. Second, uh, you know, uh, by the way, the only way you would ever get to number two in this list is if what is true about the terms, if the terms are going to zero, yeah? So then the question simply becomes, are the terms going to zero fast enough? And that's what uh, all the other tests are designed to detect, yeah? Whatever they might be, that's what they're designed to detect, okay? So is the, is the series one of the special types? Is it geometric? Is it a P-series? I would even add in, uh, there was one other type that we talked about that, that, that isn't in the book per se. What was the other kind that we talked about? Like logarithmic? logarithmic p-series, which by the way, uh, had the same requirement as the p-series requirement, yes, uh, in order to have convergence, okay? Telescoping or alternating, okay? If it's one of those, then you kind of know how to proceed, yeah, okay? Uh, third, I think this is a, a good place to go next. Can the integral test, uh, the root test, or the ratio test be applied, okay? So if it, uh, the integral test, I typically will, uh, that only applies to series with which kind of terms in it? What's, the integral test only applies to series with positive terms, and the terms need to be going to zero in a decreasing way, yes? If that is true, then you can basically turn the sum into an integral and sort out convergence or divergence that way, okay? The root and the ratio test, though, uh, specifically, so, as, so integral test, only positive terms. Root test, though, positive or negative, right? Ratio test, positive or negative, okay? And incidentally, alternating, like an alternating series, right? Positive or negative, okay? Uh, obviously, in that case, they specifically flip back and forth between positive and negative. And even the nth term test, right, uh, th that deals with series with both positive and negative terms, okay? But the integral test only deals with series with positive terms. The root and ratio tests, though, are a little bit, uh, a little bit more capable than that. And I would say that the last thing you should think about doing is, uh, you know, a potential comparison, because that's where things get a little bit complicated sometimes either direct comparison by slipping a known diverging series below the one in question or putting a known converging series above the one in question. Um, that gets a little bit tricky. And, uh, and, you know, and one of those comparison tests is the one that I said is probably the most powerful of all and will really clean up the mess of anything that's left, and that is the limit comparison test. Okay, but there, it, it can really get a little bit tricky um, 
because you have to compute a limit, right? You need to kind of pick the thing that's appropriate, but most of the time that just amounts to you basically ignoring stuff that isn't contributing all that much, okay? So compare favorably. So here we have both the DCT and the LCT. And the LCT can clean up just about any mess that's, that's left behind, yeah? Okay. Any questions on that? That's, that's kind of like a good hierarchical scheme for how we would proceed through testing a series for convergence divergence. These are all the tests, yeah? Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, one over two and squared plus one, right? I mean, technically speaking, you could you could turn that into an integral test situation, but but why, right? I mean, that's going to involve the arctangent for sure. If I if I have to integrate one over two x squared plus one, that's going to involve arctangent somehow as an antiderivative. That's probably going to get a little bit gnarly, you know. Uh, so it's possible to sort of use integral tests, but in that case, you're right. Uh, you might just opt to like skip over and say, well, the plus one, what is that actually doing? Not much. Either I can directly compare that because one over two and squared plus one, which I mean, you're, you're talking about this, right? Right. That clearly is smaller than what? Some, I could even pull out the one half at that point, right? one half, one over n squared. All I basically did was drop the plus one. And then just by direct comparison, because that P series converges, the original thing converges, right? So there are times where you might opt to do something like that and skip down to number four because it's so easy. But most of the time, I mean, I, I would say there are times where direct comparison can get a little bit unpleasant, okay? Good question. So other questions? Okay. Okay, here's the stuff we know. So in term, this is a nice little table um, that I have here in these. These are the slides from the ratio and root test section. Okay. So somebody hands me a series. Uh, in this case, do I have to have the terms being all positive to apply the nth term test? No, right? The terms could be positive or negative. Conditions of convergence. Notice there is a big fat blank spot right there. Why? Because you can't conclude convergence from that. Does that make sense? Okay. Conditions of divergence are that the limit of the terms is different from zero. Okay. And, and I notice there's a comment right here. <laughs> this test cannot be used to show convergence. It can only be used to show divergence. Okay. Uh, geometric series, you know, uh, if you have something of the form sum n equals zero to infinity ar to the n, where the ratio, and by the way, you don't really need this to be strictly larger than zero. You could still, um, you could have this thing be equal and you would still be okay. Uh, if, if r is an absolute value less than one, you have convergence and you actually know what the sum is. And by the way, we actually know something more than what's written here. Uh, I could maybe start this at M, and how does that change the formula? You guys remember? If I start it to the power M, how does that change this formula? Right, AR to the M, that's it, right? Just kind of adds that extra facet in there. Uh, just want to make sure you're on top of things there. Um, geometric series could have positive and negative terms also, correct? Because the, the common ratio could be, could be negative. Okay. Telescoping series. Um, okay, so this one, I, I wanted to just kind of explain something. So this is, this thing equals, I mean, think about it for a minute. It's B1 minus B2 plus B2 minus B3 plus B3 minus B4, right? Do you see what's happening here? Okay, so like, so like, think about it. This guy right here would be the first sum and that would be S1, right? That would be the first partial sum. What would be the second partial sum? 
What would be the second partial sum? Right, so this would be S2, this would be the second partial sum, and that would be the B2s would cancel and you'd be B1 minus B3. Do you see a pattern? What would S3 be? B1 minus B4. What would Sn be? Or S, yeah, right, so like the nth partial sum. It's B1 minus something. B1 minus uh, B sub N plus one. That's exactly right. Okay, and if the limit of this, if the limit of Bn plus one is some number, like zero or five or whatever it is, you can kind of see that the sum is gonna be uh, B1 minus that limit, right? I mean, right here they have limit as n goes to infinity of Bn, but of course, you know, it, it doesn't change anything if I put Bn plus one in there, right? If Bn is going somewhere, then the terms after it, those are going to the same place, okay? And that's why the total sum just ends up being B1 minus that limit. Does that, does that kind of make sense? That was the one where we kind of had to do like a partial fraction decomposition potentially, okay? Okay, any questions on that? Okay, then I have the P-series uh, row here. And I would also like say, you know, perhaps potentially logarithmic P-series, okay? And that means I could in theory have like a logarithm of N up here and I could even have logarithm of N raised to some power, okay? Uh, to the Q. And, th and the conditions would still be the same, okay? Um, and I, act I actually remember, I think I told you that you don't need, you don't need to assume that P is bigger than zero. P could even be zero or negative and you would still have the same conclusion. You would just have an extremely stupid series in that case. You would, the terms would go to infinity in that case, so it would even fail the nth term test, okay? Alternating series, we just need the, the stuff that doesn't have the minus ones, the, you know, the, the negative signs in there. You need those things to be decreasing to zero and you will have convergence, right? Remember, this is the convergence column here, okay? And this is the divergence column. And there wasn't really anything, notice there's a big blank here in terms of divergence, right? I mean, we just said, look, if the alternating series test fails, it just fails to tell you something about it, okay? You would have to resort to other things. Uh, the alternating series test gave us a way to tell if something is converging, okay? And we talked about the remainder, that the difference between the total sum and the nth, the nth partial sum is no more than the very next term in absolute value. Uh, we talked about that very briefly, but I just wanted to put that in the table here. Any questions on this portion of the table? This is a summary of what we've done so far, okay? Any questions? Okay. Well, the integral test, right? Uh, you want the terms to be positive and decreasing, and then you can kind of replace the series with the integral, okay? And, uh, and basically you make the conclusion based on whether the integral converges or diverges. And there is a formula for a remainder there as well, but we didn't really get into that. I just put it in there as, you know, just extra information. Then we have the root and the ratio test. And uh, there, in that case, we had the test being inconclusive in the case where the limit of the nth root of the terms or the limit of the ratio of consecutive terms, if that ends up being one, then we simply can't conclude anything. And what did I say basically is happening with both of these tests? What is it, what is it sort of angling toward? What's it trying to discern in terms of like, it's trying to discern whether the series is basically behaving like a geometric, yeah? That's the, that's the basis for, for why this test works at all. <coughs> Direct comparison, okay, you start with a series. You uh, put a series above it that converges, then the original series converges. 
you put a series below it that diverges, then the original series diverges. Direct comparison only applies for terms that are positive, right? So, um, so it's positive in nature. And limit comparison, you don't have to stipulate this. The book talks about it all the time, but it's just not true. Um, if you can find a series whose terms behave in the limit, basically like the terms from the original series, then the series that you've, you know, that you've kind of created uh, as an alternative has the exact same behavior as the original series, okay? All right, so if that, if that series BN converges, then the original series converges. If that series BN diverges, then the original series diverges. And there's no, there's no need to restrict yourself to just series of positive terms. That's everything, yeah? Any questions on that, questions? Okay, here we go. You guys ready? We're gonna start applying this stuff now. Okay, this is gonna be where sort of the rubber meets the road in some sense. Uh, time to start applying what we know in the context of, um, of you know, polynomials. Polynomials, uh, what's a polynomial by the way? I mean, I don't, I don't wanna just assume that you remember what that is. What is a polynomial? Yeah, so sums of numbers, sums of numbers times powers of x, basically. Yes? You have sums of powers of x and, and numbers can be attached, right? That's what a polynomial is. Uh, everything would be a dream come true if all of calculus could be reduced to polynomials. Do you know what I mean? Because polynomials are trivial. They have easy derivatives, they have easy integrals, and you know that differentiation and integration are kind of like the bread and butter of calculus, yes? If everything was a polynomial, life would be good. Uh, and honestly, what we're angling toward right now is to try to make that dream a reality, okay? Uh, so we're gonna try our best to turn every function into a polynomial. That's it. That's what the last three sections are all about. Okay? And you might say to yourself, what? How could you turn the sine function into a polynomial? Well, just wait. Okay? How could you turn the exponential function into a polynomial? Well, uh, we will do that. <laughs> and it will be easy to do, honestly, okay? But there, there's one caveat, there's one downside, uh, the polynomial just might never stop. <laughs> it just goes on forever, okay? And therefore you end up with a series. And that's why we've been horsing around for the last six sections, trying to understand stuff about series, okay? So let's do this. So here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about polynomial approximations of elementary functions. Now by elementary functions, I mean things like sine and cosine, maybe even tangent. Hey, maybe even arc tangent, believe it or not. Uh, so why not you know, throw some arc trig into the mix? I mean, who wants, to, who wants to work with an arc trig function? Let's just be honest, right? Uh, I'd rather work with a polynomial if at all that's possible. And indeed, we will be able to. Uh, you know, things like the logarithm function seems like it would be something we want to consider, the exponential, for sure. Okay. Taylor and Maclaurin polynomial approximations of elementary functions. So uh, we're going to use this terminology Taylor, Taylor polynomial or Taylor series. Okay named for the mathematician that discovered them. And Maclaurin is just a special one of these Taylor polynomials or Taylor series. 
And then we'll even talk about, okay, if I'm going to approximate the sine function with polynomials, how far out off am I? Does that make sense? Like, if I'm indeed approximating this thing, I need to know how far off my approximation is, yeah? Uh, that would be an important question that we'll, that we'll talk about for sure, okay? All right, a tangent line, okay, and now I'm gonna start naming things. A tangent line, P sub one of X, the reason I use sub one of X is because if it's a line, what's the highest power of X? One, right? A tangent line approximates a function near the point of tangency X equal to C, since it actually agrees with the function's value and first derivative at X equal to C. Okay, uh, what do I mean? Well, for instance, if I had, uh, you know, let's see, f of x, let's uh, suppose we had f of x equal to, let's say, uh, you know, cosine of x, okay? What is the tangent line, what is the tangent line at x equal to two? And this is a question that I think you should be able to answer. Okay, what is the tangent line at x equal to, do, to two? So in other words, what I'm asking you to do here is to find, find p sub one of x, the tangent line for this particular function at x equal to two, okay? So I want you to think about that. This is something that you would have done in Calc 1, I promise. Say, find the tangent line at this point, okay? So please, uh, take five minutes. This is, this is crucially important. Take five minutes, kind of talk to someone around you about how to do this, how to do this, okay? Okay. Let me, uh, let me clean this up a little bit. So hang on. So we have f of x equal to cosine of x. And uh, we, want to, we want to consider this thing at x equal to two. We want to sort of hone in on x equal to two is the place that we're trying to be the most accurate as possible. How did you find the tangent line? What did, you took the derivative. Okay, so, uh, so what's f prime of x? Just to, you know, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence here, but what is the derivative generally? Two? Or what? <laughs> okay, what's the derivative? <laughs> Negative sine of x. Okay, okay. And uh, what is, okay, huh, all right. So what is, what is the slope at two, well, hello, that's just F prime at two, right? Which is a little awkward, right? It's like negative what? <laughs> negative sine of two, but that's a number. Let's not freak out, yeah? And, and let me ask you, okay? Uh, how do you find, remember what was, the form of the tangent line was like Y minus Y zero equals m times x minus x zero, where x zero, y zero is a point, and m is the slope. So what is our x zero and what is our y zero here? Yeah, it would be f of two, yes. Yeah? Okay, so it would be two, and then what? Cosine of two, okay? So what is the equation of the tangent line? This is sort of interesting, but the equation of the tangent line, okay, and let's use the, this P one of X business. So P one of X is gonna be equal to, how's this gonna go? I mean, if I were you, I would think about putting this guy over to the other side, for instance, yes? So it's going to be M, which is the slope, 
Okay, let me just kind of write it out longhand. So it would be F prime of two, and then you would multiply that by X minus X zero, which in this case is just X minus what? Two, yeah? And what would be, uh, and, and, and then I would have to add in what? I have to add in Y zero, but what's Y zero here? Yeah, f of two. Okay, I'm just kind of writing this out longhand. But then in the end, what we find out, I'm gonna write this up here. So P1 of X in this particular case, F prime of two was something a little bit nasty. It was negative sine of two. Okay. And then of course, this number was multiplied by X minus two. And then what am I adding in? cosine of two, and you might say to yourself, that doesn't look like the equation of a line, but it is, right? There are numbers in there, but we don't freak out. Uh -huh. So let me ask you a question. What is P1 of two? What's P1 of two? Uh, yeah, that's just gonna kill that first sum and, and you're gonna end up with cosine of two, which by the way, is the exact same thing as F of two, correct? So it agrees with the function at two, just like this says, agrees with, with the function's y value, but, it, but the claim here is that it also agrees with the derivative at two by design. Is that true? Think about it, what's P1 prime of x? What is P1 prime of x? It should not be hard to do. What's, what's the derivative of this thing? Uh, just negative sine of two. Yeah? It's just negative sine of two. Negative sine of two. It's kind of funny, negative sine, right? Negative, all right, so sort of, oh, sorry. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to keep some levity here, but uh, you guys aren't having it, okay? <laughs> okay, so it's negative sine of two, and what is that? Isn't that, is that not just the same thing as the derivative of F where? It's the derivative of f at two, which, right? I mean, look right here. Okay, it's the derivative of f at two. So indeed, it also agrees with the first derivative at this point, okay? Now, what I wanted to do was actually go over to Desmos. So any questions on this? I'm gonna show you what's going on here with Desmos. I'm gonna graph the sine function. I'm gonna graph what we just came up with. And you'll see clearly that this tangent line is, is really trying hard to approximate this thing at two, yeah? as best it can. In fact, it approximate makes it perfectly uh, in the first, like at, uh, in the value at two and the slope perfectly matches the slope of the function there, okay? So let's actually go over into Desmos. Okay, so oops, oh man, I gotta get rid of this joke. Okay, so what was the first function I said I wanted to do? Y equals sine of x, right? There's that. And now I, what I wanted to do was, uh, you know, let's, let's talk about P1. What's P1 going to be equal to? Well, we said it was negative sine of what? Two times x minus two plus cosine of two, yeah? Wait a minute here, what's, what's going on? Oh, right, that's right, we had cosine, thank you. Oops, it's a cosine function. So do you see this? So if I zoom into this graph where? Oops, I've zoomed in way too far, okay? If I zoom into this graph at two, which is right here, I should really have a pretty good approximation. Do you see that? I mean, look at that, they're almost indiscernible from one another. At the point two comma, uh, at the point two comma, I think if I just click right here, it will actually do this. There's that, there's the point of intersection, two comma, and then what is that? That is, so that's two comma, what is that, cosine of two? Cosine of two is actually negative at this particular point. But you can see that the tangent line approximates this thing fairly well. But what happens as I move away from the point x equal to two on this graph? What starts to happen? The thing starts to peel away. Does that make sense? 
the thing simply starts to peel away from that and it gets a little bit messed up, yeah? How do you think I can improve that approximation and actually come up with a polynomial that might do a better job than just the tangent line? Yeah. If you do something with the second derivative, it will do the job, okay? Okay, so let's kind of think about this, okay? Uh, let me let me go in here. Let's actually go on the whiteboard here. Okay, and we'll talk about this together. So this is very it's a very important discussion because it's going to lay the groundwork for a lot of stuff we talk about in the future. Uh, so I started with the function f of x equal to cosine of x, correct? Okay. And I'm looking at this thing. Uh, I want to I want to look at this thing around x equal to two. That's where I want my best approximations to take place. We already discovered right. So f prime of x, of course, is f prime of x, of course, is negative sine of x. Okay, and the second derivative at x is equal to is equal to what? What's the second derivative? Negative cosine of x. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So what do you think? Uh, and by the way, we already discovered that the tangent line approximation at x equal to 2, p1 of x, that was equal to negative sine of 2. Okay, that, that was the slope times x minus 2 plus cosine of 2. Okay. Now here's the thing. If I wanted, so let me just kind of write this down here and this will be our, our theoretical discussion. If I wanted to approximate, uh, if I wanted to approximate this function with um, some kind of second degree polynomial where I had a times x minus two quantity squared, plus b times x minus two plus c, okay? Then what you can, you can actually stare at this and you can start doing some calculus moves in order to actually figure out what a, b, and c should equal, okay? So for instance, what, okay, so think about this for a second. What should I plug in for x to kind of sort out what C would have to be in this little equation. What could I plug in? Two. So if I plug in X equal to two, so if I plug in X equal to two, what I get is that C should be what? F of two. Do you see that? Yeah, if I just plug in two, I get like these two things would become zero. The A times X minus two squared plus B times X minus two. Both of those would become zero. And I get that C would have to be F of two, okay? Next, if I take the derivative of this thing, so I have F prime of X, right? Again, this is supposed to be an approximation. Uh, okay, if I take the derivative of the right-hand side of this, what do I get? Help me out, what would happen? Two a times x minus two to the first plus b. That's right. And can I get my hands on what b is at this point? What could I plug in? <laughs> Again, two. Yeah. So if I plug in x equal to two again, what I discover is what? What's b equal to? What should b be equal to? Yeah, b should be f prime of two, which is basically what, what we had up here. Think about it. This guy right here, think about it for a second. This guy right here, that is f prime of two, is it not? And this guy right here, right? That was the constant at the end. That is f of two, right? So this is exactly following what we had just done before in that example. But now we're kind of talking about this more in general. What do you think I should do next, right? Daniel suggested we do what next? 
Take the second derivative. Okay, f prime prime of x, what should that be approximated by um, to preserve how things are behaving? 2a. And can I figure out what a is on, based on this? What's that? Yeah, I mean, uh, right. So, I mean, if there were higher powers of x, it would be totally obvious what we should plug in because we would want to kill all of those higher powers of x. Does that make sense? And the way you would do that is by plugging in x equal to 2 again. Does that make sense? So what, what, what do we see? If we plug in, let's just keep this pattern of plugging in x equal to 2. We see that a 2a should be equal to f prime prime of what? 2. Another way of saying that is that a would be what? Yeah, one half f prime prime of two. That's exactly right. So what does it look like our formula should be for P2 of x? Let's kind of write this down. P2 of x should be equal to, we figured out what a was, it's right here. We figured out what b is, it's right here. We figured out what C is, it's right here, right? So we know what A, B, and C are in this little equation right here. So it would be A, which is one half F prime prime of two times X minus two squared plus F prime of two times X minus two to the first power plus, F, uh, oops, I have F prime of X. What should I have written there? Sorry. 2, right? We were plugging 2 in everywhere. 2. And then the last thing I have, right, what's C? C is just f of 2. Okay, so this should be the second degree polynomial that we use. Okay. Well, I know what f prime of 2 is. I know what f of 2 is. Uh, the only question is, what's f prime prime of 2? Well, that's easy. I have what f prime prime is right here. So f prime prime of 2 is simply what? Negative cosine of two. You see what I mean? So P2 of X is equal to one half F prime prime of two. So that's gonna be, you know, negative one half cosine of two. Okay, so that number times X minus two squared. Uh, okay, what's the next thing? So it'll be plus negative sine of two times what? Times x minus two to the first plus cosine of two. Okay, are you seeing the pattern here? Okay, you're sort of seeing the pattern. So let's actually go over into Desmos. Any questions on this about how we were proceeding? And basically we just were thinking about kind of differentiating both sides over and over again, and then kind of equating things as we had need. The only questionable one is that last one because it looked like I had 2a equal to f prime prime of any x. But again, if there were higher powers of x minus 2 in there, it would be obvious that you would still need to plug in x equal to 2. Does that make sense? In order to get rid of the other things. Okay, so let's go over into Desmos and then we'll kind of take a peek at, at what this thing is starting to look like. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so let me see here. Let me share my screen. Okay, here's Desmos. Okay, so what I have here for P2, so this is P2 equals, okay, so what was it? Negative one half or something? Negative one half what? Cosine of two, and that was all multiplied by? x minus two, what? Squared. And then I had plus, okay, just, just to, you know, make sure we're all above board here, I'll, I'll put these, uh, I'll put this number in parentheses. Okay, plus, I'm just trying to keep things nice and organized, negative sine of two times what? x minus two to the first power. And then finally, what do we have? 
cosine of two. Okay, interesting. Now let's kind of zoom out here. Do you see that it's the green curve right there? Do you see that? And what do you notice? The blue curve was the tangent line. You see the blue curve? The green curve is the parabola we just came up with. Does, does, does it not look like that green curve is staying closer to the red curve? Or the red curve is cosine of x, yes? So the green curve is, is, is starting to stay closer to the actual beginning function that we started with. And if I zoom out a little bit, that becomes a little bit more obvious, I guess. You see it? I mean, that green curve is, is really kind of trying to hold closely to cosine of x better than the original thing did. Yeah? Make sense? Okay. What do you think we're going to have to do in order to uh, continue this process? What do you guys think? We have to do higher term polynomials, yes? So like P2 of X, let me just kind of write in here. I don't know if this will, let, oh yeah, it's gonna let me, cool. Okay, so think about it. P1 of X, let me write it in red here. P1, P1 of X is equal to uh, F prime of two, times x minus two plus f of two. P two of x, what we ended up with was, uh, you know, f prime prime of two all over two times x minus two squared plus f prime of two times x minus two plus f of two, yeah? What do you think is happening here? What do you think is happening here? Like what, what do you think would happen with like a third degree polynomial, for instance? If you had to guess, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, F triple prime of two, and, and how did you, how do you, how do you come up with six, Jared? That's actually correct. But how do you come up with six? Okay, so why would you why would you suggest six? Uh-huh. That's right, because the the two came from the derivative. Like the two came down. Does that make sense? When you do the third derivative, the third power thing, it's gonna be three, and then it's gonna be two. It's gonna be one you have to solve for that, right? So you're gonna have three times two times one, basically, yes which is really three factorial, yeah? So really what's going on here is it's three factorial times X minus two cubed plus, and really we could write the second one, uh, the second derivative at two, I could really think of two as what? Two factorial times X minus two squared plus what? Oh, oops, not, not, what am I writing? What's the, what's the next term gonna be here? The first derivative at two divided by, this is sort of stupid, but just so we discern the pattern, I could write one factorial below this, and this would be times X minus two to the one, plus what would the next, what would the last term be, honestly? Yeah, F of two over zero factorial, because we know zero factorial is really like one anyways. And you could even stupidly write x minus two to the zero if you wanted to, because that's really like one anyways. Does that make sense? The pattern persists at every single term, okay? What is the third derivative, okay? So really basically what we have to do for the next one is we would have to take the third derivative of that function. What is the third derivative of that function? First derivative was negative sine, Second derivative was negative cosine. What's the third derivative? Sine. Does that make sense? Okay. F prime 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 of X is just sine of X. Again, okay. Or it's just sine of X. So I would have to do the third derivative at two uh, to, to sort this thing out. So let's actually put in a next thing here. I'm not gonna erase all this stuff, but P3, what would P3 be? 
oops, what's going on here? E3 equals what? So what would I have? Sine of two divided by, I can, maybe I can even do three factorial, who knows, right? And then that, that would be x minus two raised to the third. Okay, and then I would go plus. Okay, I'm just gonna be really pedantic about everything here. It's gonna be uh, the second derivative at two, which is negative cosine of two, yes? Okay, so let's do that. Negative cosine of two, and let's divide that by what? Two factorial, just to be really pedantic about the whole thing. And it would be x minus two quantity squared, Plus, okay, what's the next thing? It's the first derivative, yeah, at two over one factorial, which is negative, you just say negative sine of two divided by one factorial, okay, and, and then and let, let's start, let's stop horsing around at this point, right? This is gonna be x minus two to the first power, and I would go plus, what is it, cosine of two or something like that, right? And look at that. Do you see that purple curve that they have sitting right there? Okay, let me uh, erase all this other junk. But do you see that purple curve? Let's kind of zoom in here a little bit. Does it look like the purple curve is even doing perhaps a better job than the green curve? Look at that. The red curve is somewhere in there. The red curve is the original function, yes? Do you see that the purple curve is actually hugging more closely to the original function than the previous two guys, the, the tangent line, the quadratic, the second order polynomial, the third order cubic approximation is doing even better. You see what I'm saying? Yeah? And we could continue this process of moving forward with higher and higher and higher uh, ordered polynomials to try to approximate this function. And where are the best, best approximations gonna be? Just so we're clear. Right, so these are best, so the best approximations are near x equal to do, x equal to two by design. Okay, so the best approximations are near x equal to two by design. That's where we kind of started this process. And we proceed with powers of x minus two to that end. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's right. You have to know uh, basically that point that we kind of build the series around, that's called where you're centered around. Okay, so like for centered around x equal to two, that means the best approximations are right there. And the further away from two that you go, the approximation gets worse and worse. Does that make sense? I mean, look, if I move, look, that even the purple curve, you see with the purple curve, it's just diving away from the sine function or from the cosine function once we start getting away from two. Does that make sense? But it looks pretty darn good close to two. And it actually stays pretty close to the curve, even a little bit, little bit of a distance away from two, yeah? It's doing better than the green curve and better still than the blue curve, yeah? So the tangent line is worse than the parabola which in turn is worse than the cubic. And of course, a fourth degree polynomial would be even better approximation or further out away from two. But two is kind of the center of where the good approximations are, yeah? All right, any questions on that? Yeah. So really the three that are kind of going on here, you have to take like the smallest and you can't um, take it as a really good approximation. You still would be because uh, because, uh, right, yes, you still would have to do that. Uh huh. Yeah, and you would just have to keep going forever. And like, eventually, like, it, it'll, it'll really stay close, but then all of a sudden it'll go whoop, like that. But then you just take more and more powers and you can kind of see how you're gonna end up with an infinite series in the end. Yeah. Yes, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah, and you can kind of see what it is. It basically has to do with taking like what's gonna be sitting next to x minus two to the n? Well, it's gonna be the nth derivative of the function evaluated at two divided by n factorial. Yeah, so that's what we're gonna write down first thing tomorrow and we're gonna look at lots of, uh, lots of examples to that end. All right?
That's it. 